Okay. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. It's nice to see so many people coming in and uh, quite a competitive slot. <laughs> um, I just wanted to uh, introduce Ryan Jarama, first of all. Um, he's going to be co-presenting with me today. Um, Ryan is the project lead for Drupal Commerce and uh, CTO. No, what's your role at Commerce? CTO Ryan? Drupal CTO, Commerce. Yeah. CTO Drupal yeah. Commerce. Um, so, you know, Ryan wasn't directly involved in this project, but this is a partnership project that we did with Commerce guys. So, it'd be, and Ryan may have lots of questions <laughs> during this. <laughs> so, um, we're going to just, uh, I've got lots, of, lots to talk about, uh, lots to tell you, uh, but Ryan may have questions coming through. And we'll have lots of time for questions at the end from anyone. Um, so and I also feel comfortable not having been involved in the project to say that it's pretty epic, Rich. <laughs> um, just the sheer depth of functionality that we just saw um, is pretty pretty impressive. So, um, Rich, I don't know your title at ICOS, other than owner. <laughs> well, I'm the, I'm the technical. The guy pulling the strings. Yeah, I'm the technical yeah. director at ICOS. Yeah, um, and Rich has been a, a long-time contributor to Drupal Commerce with his team. We've had a great partnership for the last several years, maybe since 2010, I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, and so having supportive partners like ICOS is essential to the development of Drupal Commerce and the commerce ecosystem, and of course to Commerce Guys as a company. So really value you guys and appreciate what you've done, especially with flagship sites like Lush. So. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so, that, well, the first thing about Lush that was brilliant is that let us talk about it. You do so many of these sites and it has to be behind closed doors. You're not really allowed to talk about how you've gone about it. I'm sure everyone's sort of experienced that. Um, so with Lush, they're a pretty open company um, and they're very happy for us to talk about the project. Um, so. But if you've never heard of them, let me just check that first. Has anyone, <laughs> who's actually heard of, uh, of Lush? Who's outside of the, okay, anyone outside of the UK? I know Miles Lush? uses the lip scrub, <laughs> the sugar lip scrub. <laughs> so, so Lush, uh, well Lush Digital we've been working with, they're an, uh, a high street store, very, very big store in the UK. They're an ethical, natural handmade cosmetics company. In the UK, they're sort of known as like the bath bomb people. That's their, their key products that everyone knows them for. And certainly, um, when you go past one of their stores, you can smell it a mile away. And the combination of, of smells coming out of there. <laughs> but it was only when we got involved that we understood a little bit more about this company and how much more there was to them than, than just this sort of bath bomb store. Now, they're, they're based out of the UK, but they do actually have, well, at the time I wrote this slide, 900 plus stores in 50 different countries around the world and a massive turnover, um, which has far exceeded what we, what we expected <laughs> for, for what we perceived that company to be. So there's a, you know, more than $600 million turnover, and I'm sure that number's out of date as well. So we got involved with Lush in a joint, uh, joint pitch with Commerce Guys, um, and the, what they were trying to do when we were present, what they presented to us, what their vision was, what they were trying to achieve with their website, and it was very much about what they've called, what is now an industry term, content-driven commerce. And the idea of this, it's about mixing selling products with the stories that go behind them. So gone are the days where you build a brochure website and then strap a commerce site onto the side of it. This is now what we're seeing in the market is all about merging these things together, making this, the stories that sell the products. So people don't just want to see lists of products anymore and press add to cart. They want to know a bit of the background. They want to know a bit more about what's going on. Now with Lush, they're, as I say, they're a very ethical company. They do a lot of charity work. Um, they, they have people out in, in the world looking for ingredients, ethically sourcing ingredients and stuff like that. Even smoking charity pot? Yeah. <laughs> 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 so they have got people out there, and they've got good stories. They've got every ingredient that goes into these products has a story that goes behind it uh, about where it might have come from, maybe the, the, the farmers or the fair trade people that have been working with it. Um, so this is a perfect brand to be able to do this storytelling kind of e-commerce. So what we were looking for, or what they were looking for, was a way to merge together their website stories and their e-commerce. And that's how we were able to win the pitch, really, with Drupal and Drupal Commerce, because it was, they were looking at the time at the, the big name e-commerce vendors. Um, but what we were able to offer was the combination of content and commerce within one platform. Because Drupal Commerce being 
you know, a, a set of modules that adds onto Drupal. Drupal has all the community, content management, and everything else, and the extensibility. Um, so that, that gave us a real edge, being, a, being able to look at it that way. The other thing was, of course, being open source. It appealed to their, their ethics and their sort of the way the company operates. So that was another big advantage for us. So as soon as, uh, you know, this, this site in particular wasn't, wasn't a, a one-man show by any means. Um, we were working with Commerce Guys from the beginning. We also were working with a design agency called Method, who are a London-based agency. So they did all of the uh, visual design and interaction work. And then, of course, we were working with the Lush Digital team in-house, their own developers and their own uh, design team. What I wanted to show you today, I want to break down this site because I have the opportunity to tell you a little bit more about what's under the hood. So we're going to do a bit of a, a deconstruction today. Um, and I want to talk to you about the different elements of how we built the site, uh, how, how we used a pattern guide or a style guide, depending on what the trendy term is at the moment, um, how we built some particularly complex page layouts and the techniques we used, how we did the search and catalog pages using Apache Solar, and how we integra integrated lots of different third-party systems to, into Drupal to provide the best uh, combination of features. And then finally, a little bit about performance, because as you can imagine, e-commerce sites need to perform, they need to be fast, and this particular one is under very high demand. There's lots of, you know, lots of traffic, lots of customers. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how we address those sorts of performance issues. And Ryan, if you want me to elaborate on anything, just... Uh, I'll ask the hard questions. <laughs> we've got some time to do that. <laughs> so it, it was really important on this site that the design was done in collaboration with us. Um, there's a live... Uh, we, what we did in the end was we developed a live pattern guide. This site needed to handle six breakpoints, so it's incredibly detailed, responsive work. Um, it wasn't so much about, you know, mobile, tablet, desktop. It was very much the design will, will switch depending on the, on the size of, of the browser that you're looking at. And we knew this was going to be a massive amount of work to do. And we also knew that we had a lot of work to do on the Drupal side. And we couldn't really wait to get the Drupal stuff done and then start working on the theme like maybe we traditionally would do. Um, so we came up with this, uh, we'd seen around people like Starbucks and they've got their, their, their star guides out there and we were <laughs> inspired by this. And we decided to build a star guide for Lush outside of Drupal. And we ended up using uh, Jekyll um, and what we were able to build was the designs were coming to us in the traditional way in Photoshop and we were able to prototype those designs in, in Jekyll uh, develop the concepts, test out the interaction stuff before we were anywhere near Drupal. And, so the, and Jekyll's a, only a recently familiar term to me, so I don't know if you want to elaborate on exactly what that is. Or yeah, so I guess Jekyll feels a bit like going back to old school. Uh, yeah. it, it's like you, it's a templating language uh, but you, which you can compile into HTML. So it's fast iterative development um, and it compiles up. So what we were able to do here is build all the individual modules of the, uh, as in design modules of the site, in in this Jekyll system, and it meant we could do the cross-browser testing early. It meant we could trial things and see how it was going to work, and because the designers needed to see the stuff, the timings of things, and that sort of stuff. But the the key thing that we did differently was that the people building this pattern guide were actual Drupal developers. They were Icos developers who knew what the sort of templates and the sort of markup that Drupal was going to end up needing. So we tried, sometimes you get a pattern guide and it's delivered by an external agency and you've just got to work with it. So the idea here was that we, we produced this style guide with sort of, sort of Drupal markup, markup that we knew was achievable in Drupal. So lots of extra divs and classes. Yep. And Loads of divs <laughs> everywhere, um, but all class driven. And it meant that what we could actually do is compile the whole style guide and then copy it straight over to the theme. So, and we also were then able to take the individual raw HTML elements and put those into the theme as well. So it gave us this portability uh, of, of the system to, to allow us to, to do this. The other massive benefit to this is that it's a permanent reference. So even though the project is now live, 
and obviously it's in continuous evolution. So everything is still trialed through this, this star guide approach. And I've got some, I can do a little demo of this in a minute. Um, I've just taken some stills so that when we upload the slides, there's actually something there because the, the star guide itself is not actually uh, public yet. So this, this just shows um, some different elements of the site. So the way we're looking at it is you don't design an entire page. You design a product element. And this is what a product looks like in this scenario. And this is what it looks like on the wish list. This is what it looks like in the cart. So every single piece of content looks different in different places. And what we do is we design those individual cases on their own. And then we're able to join all those things together later to make a complete page layout, which I'll come on to a little bit later. So I'm just going to switch over, he says. This is where it gets fun because I can't actually see what I'm doing. So I'll have to stand up here. <laughs> um, so this is, if I, can find my, if I can find my mouse pointer, this is the star guide. So all of the elements uh, that make up the site are all independently built outside here. And we also use this as a QA tool. So you'll see these green and red little Drupal icons, which... Mm which are basically part of our QA process to say this piece is done, this part is being reviewed, um, and so on. So if we go into, let's have a look, I'm trying to find, sorry, here we go, the module guide here. <coughs> this should be really fast because it's supposed to be local, but uh, <laughs> here we go. Okay, so what we're looking here is, um, this, this screen resolution is really rather large, but um, each this is what uh, you know, a product looks like in its featured mode, then the normal mode here. And as we scroll down, uh, we can see what it looks like when there are reviews. Uh, sorry, I, I just realized, because I'm not actually online, there are images here, but on the resolution of that screen, the, the particular image is almost transparent, unfortunately. Um, oops, there we go. And then the same thing, how that's displayed in the wish list. So if I try and grab the bottom of the browser. Oops, there, I've done it wrong, didn't I? Oh, going away. Yeah, wrong button. I'm trying to be able to resize the browser here. Right, so if we move a little bit further back up again, let's just take this one for example, and we move around, we can just see the responsive nature of the, of the site. I don't think that's a good example, actually. Let's come up here a little bit. So I can't show you the super wide resolutions because this screen isn't wide enough, but um, you'll see that it, it changes as we go to small sizes, ready for mobile, tablet, uh, tablet landscape, tablet portrait, and then as we go to the full desktops and, and you know things flip around. So we were able to try all this stuff out, um, and each individual element that we built. Let's just go back to this. And did you find a particular base theme in Drupal was more suited to porting the uh, the CSS and HTML from your style guide into the Drupal theme? Um, well, actually, yeah, we did use Omega Four, um, but by the time we'd done there's so much work done outside in the, in the style guide that I'm not sure how much Omega 4 did for us okay. at that point. Um, it, it ended up being quite custom. Um, so, but the way we used um, the theme here, we, we had this rather complex page layouts. So if you saw in the video at the beginning, I'll show you another one in a minute. When you go into a product page, there's a ton of information about that product. So you first of all got the e-commerce element, then you've got information about the ingredients that might be in it, any related news, related products, um, reviews, all this sort of stuff. And it ends up with a quite a, a massive amount of content to render into one page. Now, we had some internal debate between all of us as to what method to use, whether to use panels or contexts or whatever. Um, and in the end, we decided to use Drupal's built-in functionality of view modes uh, so normally when you're building a site, you will see you've got two view modes uh, out of the box. You've got your default view mode, which is your full page, and you've normally got a teaser. 
So what we decided to do here, for really for mostly ease of understanding uh, more than anything else, was we defined additional view modes for each of the methods of displaying the content. So we might have had a view mode for wish list and a view mode for product detail, uh, a view mode for uh, e-commerce mode or something like that. And that allowed us to transfer that data that we had in that style guide, those templates that were HTML, and we were able to use template suggestions to, decide, to tell Drupal which of those patterns to use for any particular scenario. And you know, there, there are other ways of doing this, but we found this way the most portable and understandable because it, it meant that when someone was looking at the page, they could see immediately it's not a ton of panels to configure. That one piece there is an individual rendering of that particular piece of content. And did you use uh, Display Suite to define those view modes or just custom? Yeah, you know? Display Suite was were absolutely the way we would go for it. And in the end, um, we, we, we did a lot of configuration Display Suite and then turned off the UI at the end. Um, because we needed really strict control on the markup um, <laughs> to, to achieve what we're trying to do with the style guide, the markup had to be spot on, and that was the whole point. So using something like Display Suite allowed us to, allowed us to do that, yeah. So this is an example um, of one of those pages. So this is a product detail page. And as I've, I hope it doesn't make everyone feel sick now moving around. So you've got ingredients directly underneath. And then you've got a story, badly cut by me there, unfortunately. <laughs> um, and then we've got reviews underneath that. And then related content underneath that. Now all of those are different renderings and different display modes of the same piece of content. So what we've done there is, is using, uh, using context to stack them on top of each other. And to take this a little bit further, when you start looking at this site and we break down the individual elements, what you're seeing here is those modules, sorry, we keep using the word modules. In Drupal world, that's obviously something different. In, these, in the design world, they're referred to as design modules. So the individual component design pieces of the site here you can see them, we just lifted them out there just for visualization purposes. And yeah, this one here, so that's showing an ingredient in that particular mode. And the way this design works, you know, we've got three ingredients, but the first one had to be slightly bigger than the other two, and it's all this sort of high detail design stuff that we had to meet these requirements for, and this method allowed us to do that. And another one here, um, we've got the different spa treatment shops, uh, different spas they've got around uh, the UK at the moment. Um, so allowing us to, to open up those individual elements as well. And then taking it a little bit further, this is the, the dashboard page of the site. So once the customer's logged in, um, and here what we're able to do again is not only view modes on content, but also view modes on orders and things like that. So when you're looking at your list of order history, you can see them in one mode. And if you're looking at them in the dashboard mode, you want to see your most recent order. And so we just render it slightly differently. And again, we were able to use these view modes to, to reflect that functionality. And so, then, so you bought a British nanny? That's right, yeah. OK. <laughs> so that was how we achieved our, uh, our page layouts. Well, if you don't mind me asking, I don't know how familiar everyone in the room is, but in Drupal Commerce, you have product data separate from your product display. Yep. And so in here, I'm not actually sure if you're even using a product display node type or if you're just pulling that all in directly via context. How, how did you actually build up a product page and then associate all of the different ingredients and reviews and whatnot with that product? So there's a lot, there is a product display. So okay. the product entity itself is the part that you need to fulfill the order. So that's the SKU, the short description, the price. And everything else is actually in a product display uh, content type. We actually had three, one for products, one for spa, and one for gifts. Um, and they're just slightly different fields on each one. So yeah, it was, it was exactly sort of the traditional model of Drupal Commerce, how, how we would do that. But what we were also doing is using a lot of entity referencing to join all the other types of content together, whether it be um, ingredients, for example, is all entity referenced across. Right, so the next thing we had to think about was search. Um, everyone knows, really, on any site of any scale, no one really uses 
core Drupal search um, because it's, it's you know, not really optimized um, for that sort of stuff. So we were using Apache Solar. Um, now that was an obvious thing to do for the main search, but what we also decided to do was use Solar for the category pages and the catalog. Um, now this was maybe sl slightly unusual, but the aim was even from the beginning, we were trying to wring out every ounce of performance that we could. And the way we were able to use Solar was uh, if, you, if, you, if you index your content in Solar, you can actually pre-render uh, using these view modes that I discussed earlier. And then that, what that meant was that when we do a search result page, we don't have to do anything in Drupal additional. We don't have to re-render content as it's coming back. And that was absolutely the fastest way we could put together a search results page. So we were able to use this for all of the catalog pages. So when you go to a list view, like the top level bath or bath bombs or whatever, those are actually search results pages. Uh, doing that allowed us various, uh, various things that we could do. Uh, it allowed us to influence the order of products, which is something that inv invariably comes up. Um, you can, of course, do that with things like no queue. Um, but what we were able to do is use some, some weighting and rules within, within Solar to influence how those results were coming back. And ultimately, it, it was all about performance. Um, Wait, so. I was going to say, if, if I'm not mistaken, it sounds like what you've done then is you, you've used Drupal as the content data store, but then you're rendering the content and caching it in Solar, and then you've sort of built a custom front end, still using Drupal, but a custom front end to all of this Drupal content with solar sort of being the back end, almost like a headless Drupal before there was a headless Drupal kind of scenarios. In a way, yeah. Um, we, we certainly probably didn't think of it in the, those terms, yeah. but yeah, we are caching a great deal of stuff inside solar so that we don't have to re-render it. And in terms of the custom presentation of that, there's a little bit of, you know, it, it's, it's standard. Um, using the Apache solar module, you can define search pages. So there was some custom work, but a lot of it was actually already there. Yeah. Um, was anybody at DrupalCon Seged by any chance? Some folks. Do you remember Rasmus Lerdor's talk? He's the creator of PHP, and he did like a, a profile of PHP to show like uh, what what parts of, of Drupal are the slowest and the fastest, and it's the rendering system that took up like seventy yeah. percent of the page requests that he was profiling. So this is cutting out a tremendous. You know, performance hit to every page load of a, of a user on your site. So yeah, no, definitely I'm impressed. <laughs> yeah. So it allowed us to do a few things. Um, actually, the search is significantly more powerful. I mean, not for a category. A category is just a list. Um, but for the, for the main search on the site, you're expecting you know, to be able to mistype terms. Their product names are quite uh, creative. Um, a lot of puns going on. So you want to be able to search for stuff and get, get results coming up. Um, so you've got much more powerful, much more accurate search. We're also uh, able to do faceted search very, very well, which I'll show you in a second. And then the last piece that we used was, um, was geospatial search, which was something, of course, you can do in Drupal using lots of open, you know, open layers and various other geo modules all bolted together. Um, but actually, Apache Solar has geo, cap geo search cap geospatial search capability anyway um, if you send it the right request. So we were able to say, right, Drupal doesn't need to do any of that stuff. We can do all of that over here, and again, take away, say, 10 modules that we don't need. So we were able to use um, Acquia Search for the category list pages, the main search, and the shop, the shop finder. By using the, the uh, geospatial search facility, we were able to do the shop finder that way. And we were able to pre-render the results in more than one format. As you've seen already, there are different ways we can display stuff. So what we were able to do is pre-render as many as we needed in that sort of you know, solar cache layer. And that gives you a result like this. This is an example of a normal category page. Um, they always have this feature uh, caption at the top. And then after that, all of that is, uh, is a solar generated return. So you can see, obviously, with the five star rating and, and that sort of stuff, we have to refresh that solar index quite a lot. Um, but whenever a product is updated or reviewed or anything, we just push another request up to Solar, refresh the layer there, and then, and then that works. Do any products have less than four stars? <laughs> <laughs> Do they support well, that? there may be some waiting. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that, that, that's the interesting thing. The community uh, of customers that this particular brand has are quite um, enthusiastic, shall we say. They even have a name. They're called Lushies. <laughs> 
Um, and you, yeah, like you would with Apple, you do get unboxing videos of Lush products going on. So, yeah, they, these guys are keen. And let's just say if there's any problems, they'll let us know. <laughs> so this is an example of the main search. So we were able to use a faceted search there at the top. Um, so basically showing different ingredients, products, stories, and shops, because Bath is a place in the UK. So not only is it a bath bomb, it's also a shop. And we were able to use that view mode approach again to render, okay, what does this piece of content look like when it comes up in the search? And then one additional thing was, what does this piece of content look like when it's number one in the search because it's bigger than all the others? So do Lushies have to be convinced to bathe? <laughs> it looks like it, doesn't it? The benefits of bathing, yeah. <laughs> Maybe they're trying to get them to do it multiple times a day, I don't know. <laughs> So that was search. And our next challenge was thinking about all the other things that this site needed to do. They were pretty, opt you know, not, not optimistic, they were pretty ambitious, is the word, about what they were trying to achieve with, the, with their new brand. And what we found was that the temptation with Drupal is to grab a module here, build a custom module here. You can do it all, of course you can. We know that, and that's what coming to DrupalCon is all about. You can learn all these ways of doing stuff. But that's not always the best way, because sometimes, you know what, there is someone out there doing a really good job of this particular thing, and isn't it better just to integrate those in? And I think um, through not just this project, but many others, we've learned that sometimes just because you can do it in Drupal doesn't necessarily mean it's the right thing to do. So with this particular site, we were able to use lots of additional uh, services. I'll just quickly run down them. So you know, uh, Metapack is an external shipping system. So you can do shipping in Drupal Commerce just fine. But if you're shipping all around the world and your shipping rules are quite complicated, that's a lot of work to set them all up. Uh, Metapack is an external service where you send a, a bundled up uh, version of the basket to an external API and it comes back and offers you what the shipping options are for that particular option. So it basically takes that whole piece of work away um, and, and uses that. They also handle the, the consignment shipping and, and that sort of thing. Uh, Postcode Anywhere is a, a UK-based um, postcode lookup system. I think it's quite expected uh, that you would, do, you would have something like that. Um, Acquia Search, we've already mentioned. You'll see, not necessarily through my slides, but through looking at the site, there's a lot of video work going on and that's all encoded off-site um, using Zencoder. We use Statla, which is a social API service, um, because we, we spent a lot of time with Commerce Guys working on integrating Twitter and Instagram and uh, Facebook, and it was painful, and anyone who's done that, you, you just don't know when these guys are gonna change the rules on you. So in the end, we decided to take that piece away and integrate a third-party service to, to just handle the social feeds and sharing stuff. Um, we've got Recommendation API, which is actually Nosto, which is a partner. Uh, Google Analytics, of course. New Relic, I'll talk about shortly. Um, Mullen we use for the reviews, anti-spam, registration, standard stuff like that. Um, we use Mandrill for outgoing mail. Uh, one of the downsides of, uh, of sending mail through Drupal sites is you're never quite sure if it ever went. Mm -hmm. um, so Mandrill is an API system, it's part of MailChimp that allows you to have traceability of where the mail sent, which is really important for you know, e-commerce, order confirmations, that sort of stuff. Um, and then they had their own order management system, which was a homespun system, uh, which we were able to, once we finally get the orders done, we send them out to there. And on the other side, um, we're using Acquia hosting in this case, uh, so there's Varnish in there, which is really important. We also use a service called Cloudinary, uh, which is a CDN for images, and it does pretty much what the Drupal image cache module does. You send a nice crafted URL, and it brings back the optimized image for you in the right size. Um, we use this in particular because, in our case, it allows us to share that library of images across multiple properties. And also, it has some very clever uh, additions, like it can do face detection. So if you want to do a customer uploads their profile picture and we want to do that little circle, then we can face detect where the, where the person's face is in the image and, and we've got that nice little thing. Otherwise, we get their shoulder or something, depending on what they uploaded. And, and then on the front of that, we've, we've got Cloudflare, which I'll talk about next. 
Let's say performance is everything with this site, with, with any site like this. Um, this is, some, you saw the length of those pages, you saw the weight of stuff we're trying to deliver here. Um, so we've got a lot of caching going on. Um, E-commerce really needs to have fast delivery and you need to keep an eye on it. So that, that was the thing, you know, you've got to know where your bottlenecks are, you've got to be able to trace things back. So we use all the standard stuff that you would expect out of Drupal. We use the Drupal's internal cache, we use the entity cache module, we use memcached, uh, all these things and varnish, particularly having a reverse proxy cache at the front, uh, really essential because it reduces the amount of traffic actually hitting the Drupal stack altogether. But the thing is, with a commerce site, it's really hard. Caching is hard. And there are so many reasons that you can't cache. So just looking at this example here, this page, it's just a normal product page, and you would hope that you'd be able to cache that mostly in its entirety. But every single piece of that where I've outlined in green, I can't cache, yeah? Because it's personalized. It's the price, maybe the price is different for me. Maybe I'm a member of staff and I get a discount. Um, Maybe the item's already on my wish list, so I don't want to add to wish list. I want removed from wish list. Maybe the product's sold out, so I can't do add to basket. And up in the left hand, that little speech bubble is actually the social feed. So that's obviously not going to be cacheable either. So there's so much stuff. And, and of course, the basket on the right hand side, I can't cache that because it's going to be different per customer. So the, the additional problem you have with a, a commerce site as opposed to something else like a, maybe a news site is that there's so many conditions where you can't, you can't get that performance enhancement you want because you can't cache everything. So that's where we've been working with, uh, with Cloudflare. Uh, so Cloudflare was brought into the project as a CDN um, because for PCI compliance reasons, uh, Lush needed a thing called a web application firewall, which is just something that tracks everything, every single transaction that's going on uh, for, just for compliance reasons. But then we we started to get more involved with Cloudflare, working with the team there, um, and realized that actually there's a lot more stuff you can cache if you're smart about how you do it. Um, and we're pretty early in the journey here, but um, we're able to cache AJAX requests, for example, which we didn't realize before. We're also able to, uh, a lot of the time, we'd, we were doing lazy loading of things like the cart, so you pop the cart open and there's a short delay while it loads in. Um, so we're able to do stuff like that. But we're investigating at the moment a, a mechanism in Cloudflare called Cache Everything, uh, which seems to, my understanding of it, that there are some Cloudflare people here, um, it seems to ignore everything that Drupal says about caching and allow you to literally cache the entire thing. Uh, and then we're looking into tricks like um, storing things like my profile picture, maybe storing that reference to that image in local storage on the browser or in a, in a cookie or something so that we don't have to hit Drupal you know, the, the goal in the performance is not, don't hit Drupal. You can make Drupal really fast, but if you don't need, you know, need to go near it, then that's even better. So it's a lot about Ajax, lazy loading, and trying to, you know, edge side includes is a, is a technique, but we've not, the trouble with edge size includes is you're just hitting Drupal twice, so you've not really got any benefit. Um, so looking at these techniques, these more advanced techniques of caching is something that's been very, very interesting. Um, but I guess the, the most important thing about all of that is it's still quite early days on that. But you need to be able to see what's going on. So the other thing that we've used very extensively is New Relic. Um, and I know they're downstairs in the exhibition hall somewhere. Um, so these guys, it, it just comes with Acquia hosting anyway. So we, we managed to, to use that system. But it traces down your every web, web transaction that's going on. And you can dig right into the detail of what's going on. So this particular graph shows the total response time for the site. The, the green part at the top is um, stuff outside of Drupal, like Facebook requests and stuff. The blue is memcache. The orangey-brown color is database. And then the rest is PHP. So you can look at what your performance bottlenecks are. Right, do I need, am I seeing too much database access? What can I do about that? Is my PHP, you know, too, too much. And when I first uh, looked at this, I was actually talking to Lorna Jane, and uh, she was saying, well, if you upgrade to PHP 5.5, we can make that blue bit at the bottom shrink. And she was spot on. It really did. We know that the difference between PHP 5.3 and 5.5 was good, but it was a massive uh, performance uplift that we saw for no effort whatsoever. 
Um, so stuff like that, being able to drill down. So New Relic allows us to get right in the middle of it and find out exactly what database queries are causing us pain or exactly which modules or hooks or, or whatever it is that's, that's causing the trouble. The additional part, of course, when you start caching, you've got to think about purging, which is the opposite of caching. You need to be able to figure out what to do in certain scenarios, like this one. Well, it's really bad uh, visibility there, but that says currently unavailable on that product. So I need to know that the moment that product goes out of stock, or more importantly, comes back into stock, that the, the cache is going to be cleared on that so that the next customer that comes along can actually buy it. Um, so what we're using as a combination, there's an expire module, um, and there's another module for, for Acquia hosting called Acquia Purge, um, and what that's doing is poking, poking the hole back through Varnish, saying, okay, invalidate that particular piece there. So using these things in combination uh, allows us to avoid that scenario where if you've got like a one hour or two hour cache going on, you've got the customer on the phone saying, no one can buy this product, no one can buy this product. So you've got to think about those sorts of things as well. The next bit, I'm going to let Ryan talk about a little bit. He doesn't even Sorry. know what it is. Um, and that's about the back end. So everything I've talked about so far is the front end of the site and the, the great customer facing stuff. But also, there's a whole other team of people who have got to process these orders and look after the site. So what we've been working on with Commerce Guys most lately uh, is a new back end system. Yeah, which oftentimes whenever you're building a new e-commerce site, we, we talk about Drupal Commerce as facilitating tailor-made e-commerce. And so you think very much about what it looks like whenever it's you know in the browser, on the front end to the customer. Um, but what you maybe think about last, if you think about it at all, is what's it like as a merchant to actually use this interface on a day-to-day -day basis to administer orders, facilitate customer service, fulfill products, and whatnot. Um, and so often, you know, often that's the last thing somebody touches or they just don't touch it at all. Um, Commerce Kickstart tried to be um, somewhat helpful um, using the Commerce back office modules and in, in implementing sort of a, a, a better practices um, back end for, for merchants than you would get out of the box with Drupal Commerce. But still every merchant has just some unique need that's slightly different from the last. And so as, as part of all of our projects in Commerce, guys, we do want to consider um, how can I tweak this view or change these rules and this business logic to um, directly support my merchant um, as another very important end user of the site? Um, and so I guess this is ongoing work still with Lush, is the actual creation of um, a new nicely themed and relevant backend to Lush's customer service team. I'm assuming this is also integrated with the order management service yep. or order management system that you know continues to be a back and forth thing. Um, you know, I, I just had a... Okay, yes, at the end of my session yesterday, I just had a scenario where somebody could actually use a custom backend to help their merchant because they were um, fulfilling products on an order on a, on a line item by line item basis, but wanted to have uh, you know, a line item status field that was editable on the back end and then visible on the front end so a customer could see which of the products in their order had been fulfilled so far. And so within Drupal, because this whole back end interface, especially the uh, line item list, uh, which is not present on the screen yet. Um, <coughs> because the line item list is built using the views module um, within Drupal Commerce, um, I was able to say, well, you just need to add a new field to your line item type, expose it to this view on the back end using editable fields so the merchant could come in and toggle the, the status of a product's delivery on a line item basis. And then on the front end, where the customer would view the order, edit that view just to show the static representation of this field. Um, and he was able to, you know, then build a custom fulfillment workflow using Drupal Commerce in about, you know, 10 clicks. Yep. And so I know there's more to this work here, and I'll let, I'll let you take that back over, Rich. But, you know, this is just sort of a, a feature-rich, you know, targeted backend for Lush that ideally will be abstractable and then shareable out as a sort of new reference backend implementation. Yeah. I guess one of the biggest problems we were trying to solve here was, well, first of all, multiple sites feeding into one common customer care interface. So... Uh, I won't go into that today, but this, we've got a sort of a headless order management system. But the other thing was that with, when you've got a really busy site, the, the concept in Drupal Commerce is that an order or a cart is an order, just of a different status. So when you start adding two million carts to your system, it really starts to slow down. So what we were trying to do here, uh, what we found was one of the pain points of the site being slow was actually the customer care team looking for an order 
Yeah. And then what we'd find was that because the site had gone slow, more customers would phone up to for help with their order, <laughs> and the whole <laughs> thing would start to snowball. Yeah. So our aim, our aim here was not only to provide more functionality for the customer care team, but also we've managed to integrate uh, Drupal Commerce with Search API um, so that you, when you're searching for orders, you can pretty much search for anything that you've got from the customer, whether it be their postcode, their name, their order number, whatever. Um, yeah, because it's, it's using solar, yeah. you haven't got that additional weight on top of, uh, on top of Drupal. Uh, it sort of takes that piece outside. So that's using uh, Search API. And then we were able to... Oh, it's doing that again, isn't it? <laughs> um, add additional functionality, like uh, look, customers need, look, customer care need, like being able to do uh, refunds, reissues. Um, this is a, an example of the reissue page. If, if an order never got there what, and the customer phones up, they will often resend the order at no cost. Um, and so it's being able to manipulate those orders very, very quickly and just do the tasks that they need to do to, to fulfill their job every day. And it, did your UX team at ICOS design the backend interface? So we, we, the UX ICOS worked with the customer care team, to, okay. uh, and that was uh, Nick extensively worked with them um, on site just to make sure that they were really happy because these guys, we need to make sure they're happy and customer care for Lush is the most, the most important thing. Um, and then we teamed up with, with Commerce Guys because we knew in this case there's a lot going on. Uh, there's trying to make the commerce back end all in one page is really tough. So uh, we've been working very closely with Commerce Guys on this particular one. And, if, and we still are. We're not quite there yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just finally, just before we go to questions, maybe bringing out some of the lessons learned um, that during, during this project... So my first one was, yeah, New Relic will save your life. And I'm not sponsored by New Relic, but I love this product. <laughs> and it really did help us. When we had performance issues, it helped us find them really quickly. Otherwise, you know, you can be, with such a complex site, there's so many interacting parts. You're like, oh, I don't know what's causing this problem. New Relic allowed us to pinpoint stuff really, really quickly. I think the next one was... Never, never underestimate the complexity of the migration part. So what we were doing here was migrating previous sites from multiple countries into a new site, um, migrating a, a bespoke, well, slightly modified uh, open cart system. Um, and it's just, it's a big job, no matter what. Um, and also the sheer amount of data you've got to move and, and how long that really takes. I think the full migration took about four days to actually run end to end. Mm -hmm. And when you suddenly realize you're going live on Monday and it's Thursday, you better start that thing running. <laughs> so that was uh, really important to plan that. Thinking about the build versus buy. Building it is not always the best way. I think I covered that earlier, but knowing when, when is the right time to spend a bit of money, even though you might feel not obliged to do so. Keep your partners close. We worked really, really closely with both Commerce Guys and with Method and with the Lush team on this. But certainly with the, with the design team, it was really important. We were pretty much embedded in their offices um, so that they could trial out interactions. And they understood what our pain points were, and we understood how much they wanted their pixel perfection. So <laughs> it, it was really good to be able to work with them. Otherwise, you know, you have this thing where they finish their job, they throw it over the fence, and then no one's happy because you didn't, you didn't really see the detail that they were looking for. The next one, yeah, caching. Caching's hard. Yeah, just accept that. It's hard, and there's lots going on. The next one's maybe not so obvious. Um, think about your contrib modules and think about custom. What we found was that sometimes there was a piece of functionality, there's a contrib out there that would do that, but that contrib might do 10, 10 other things. And we had to be really careful not to overload the site with stuff that we just didn't need. So uh, quite a lot of the time, we were looking at a contrib saying, like, for example, wish list. There was a wish list contrib out there, but it didn't do quite what we wanted. So we ended up using flag and some custom work on that. So it, we just found that just because there's a contrib, it doesn't necessarily mean it's the right fit. So it's, it's basically spending time evaluating, figuring out what's the right thing. And next one's remembering the legacy especially if you're an agency, who's going to be picking this thing up? Who's going to look after it in the long term? 
Um, you know, in our, in our sort of situation, we've got to remember the in-house team. We've got to remember that these guys are going to be looking after it. So we ideally want them involved. And also, obviously, we want them to understand what we've done so we don't just arrive on launch day and say, there you go, have fun. And then the next thing, yeah, well, the last thing, really, uh, try when you're moving in a fast-moving environment, these guys, they had a launch date. That launch date wasn't going to move. Um, we had to get this stuff out there. But we had to think about what was going to come post-launch. There was a ton of features that we didn't quite get ready in time, but we knew what they wanted to do. So it's all about planning for that. But if you spend all your time planning and figuring out, oh, well, if we do it this way, we've got to worry about that, that that's coming next. And that, that's perfectly valid to do, but if you do it too much, you never launch. So what we had to do was say, we've got a plan, we've got to think about tomorrow, but we don't want to over-engineer everything. That it's okay to come back and change some stuff later in the next iteration. So those are our lessons. Um, there's a lot going on here, lot, lots of stuff to talk about. Um, we love talking about this project, and it's great to be able to talk about it with, 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 uh, with Ryan as well. So. Um, any questions or anything, we're open to the floor. The mic's in the middle there. Thank you very much. Okay, I left you room for questions now. <laughs> Otherwise, Ryan would just keep talking. Hi, do you want to come over to the mic? You've got Because of the recording. I'll repeat it. Yeah, that's fine. I can repeat it. This question is, why are you making me walk with a stupid microphone? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, first of all, thank you very much. It's really good to take a detailed look at uh, an excellent site like this. I was wondering if it's possible for us to have a, a deeper look, maybe at the actual forms for uh, creating and editing the products on the site? Um, is that something you'd be able to I do? Could, I can do that, maybe not live. Um, but I can probably do that in our, on our stand maybe later, if that's okay. all right. Um, because, yeah, this, I can definitely show you the back end, how it's working for editing products. I, I'm a, I can't quite do that on a live demo, but as you <laughs> saw how much trouble I was having earlier. Yeah. <laughs> but um, by all means, we'll catch up, yeah. How did you implement customer reviews? I don't know that comes up fairly often. Okay, so, yeah, customer reviews um, was a, just a custom content type okay. using uh, five-star and flag. So um, we use flag for the report as inappropriate and the like and don't like part of the review. Um, five star for the stars, obviously, as you'd expect. And then we used um, entity reference to refer them backwards to the product. So pretty standard Drupal components, actually, for that. Um, and it's probably a little bit of, because of the way we had to do that, the most popular theme, the most popular review, the most recent review, and the top rated one, for example, um, we had to do some, some work in voting API to recalculate all those sums on cron and stuff like that. Cool. Any others while we're here? Other than Guess we call it. Oh, oh. No, we've got one more. Okay. All right. Hi. Um, yeah, really good talk. Um, looks like a really complicated e-commerce site, obviously. So how difficult was it to define the requirements of a client, given you had a fixed <laughs> deadline to work towards? Uh, so this was an agile project. Um, we were working to an MVP, although that it became a bit of an in-joke. Um, you know, MVP meant everything. Um, <laughs> so no, but we were working on an agile process. So we were doing two-week iterations, demos at the end of each, um, and Although we weren't launching anything between those iterations, it was very much keeping the client and the design team in touch with what was going on, um, making sure that, that we were working on the critical path of e-commerce functionality first, and then all the associated story stuff. So yeah, this is a, this is a co pretty good agile-based agile case study as well, um, and highlighting the importance of co-location in that sort of scenario as well, which is not something that I normally think is hugely important, but in this case, it was really good to have um, Drupal developers with the agency working on the interaction and making sure that everyone knew 
what everyone else was going through <laughs> at that point. So, yeah. Thank you. Hi. Yeah. Sorry. Go on. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was great, uh, a great uh, case study. So thank you um, first. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the mapping integration that uh, you did, and are you actually uh, doing anything with the inventory using going back to the actual stores where things are available? <coughs> Okay, so uh, the mapping was open layers um, with a custom Google, uh, Google Maps overlay, a custom style set. Um, the, as I said to you, the, the, the actual content is delivered from solar. So what we were doing is a custom, no, no it wasn't custom. There is a way to present solar geospatial results in open layers. I think it needed a little bit of a tweak. But generally what we're doing there is bringing the results straight back um, and then we're displaying them like a normal open layers map. So all of this is, you know, a lot of it is slightly tweaked, but the fundamentals are, you know, Drupal the way it should be. Uh, sorry, there was a, another follow-up, wasn't there? Sorry. But I'll come back to the other one in a sec. <laughs> I was just wondering, it's the usual question, but who uh, were you competing with or for Lush? Were they using Drupal already or did you no. fighting against they weren't, or other? They weren't using uh, Drupal yet. Um, we were considered the wild card, I think. I think it's fair to say. Um, we were competing against Miles here in, you remind me? <laughs> yeah, Demandware and Magento were the main competition in the pitch. We were last in. Um, but I think because we were able to offer that unified vision of one system doing everything, that was really something that they were looking for and they didn't realize they could do. Um, so, yeah, I think it certainly made them feel like it was worth, uh, for, worth taking the direction of Drupal. I think they're, and now they're, they're flipping all of their properties, so it must have been okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry, the other question was about inventory. Um, I didn't go into that. That's a whole other story. But... That they do have a thing called the kitchen, um, which is limited run products. And the way they work is that they do a limited batch out of an actual kitchen. They make up 200 of something of products, and they sell them out for that one day. And as I mentioned, the Lushies out there know what's coming this week. They tweet out what's coming, and there's massive demand for these products in a short space of time. So what we've had to build for them is a stock reservation system. So what it does... Um, we've, we've had a couple of approaches, but the one we've got currently, it it's, works a bit like um, a deli counter. So you get a product, you take a ticket, and that you get half an hour to finish checkout. And if you don't, your ticket self-destructs. And then you might be able to get the product, you might not. It depends whether it's got anything left. So we started off with the commerce stock module, uh, but we, we d weren't able to get that working super reliably with that type of concept. So we've ended up building a custom stock reservation system, which may be, I'll speak to Ryan, may be worthy of going into Contrib. Um, so yeah, um, it's, but the, the actual physical stock is held by the external system, so we're doing a lot of web services chat to figure out what's in stock at any one point, and lots of caching of that. Um, and the last thing we've done is adaptive caching. So when we're checking for stock levels, if we know that there weren't many left, we'll check more frequently. Hmm. Whereas if we know there's 10,000, then we'd probably not check till tomorrow. So again, just a little, little performance things like that, trying to figure out what we're doing there. <laughs> Go on, yeah. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Do they have a multiple warehouse system or just one in the UK in global warehouse? Uh, there is a single warehouse at the moment. Yeah. And, and can people buy and collect in stores as well? Or? Not yet. It's on the map. On it's the on the roadmap. Um, we're not doing that yet. Well, at the moment, we're in the process of launching the Dutch site and the, and the other European sites. So that's taken priority at the moment over new features. So very soon, we'll have pan-European sites that look like this one. Uh, the, the ones that look, if you look at the Dutch, Spanish, and, and other European sites at the moment, they're using their old conceptual design. Um, I just found out, actually, Brazil uh, launched this morning. Um, which is a great achievement for, for the team out there working with oh, okay. yeah. a, good, a good story that um, I went to the code sprint uh, with Ryan back in a couple of years ago, Drupal Commerce, and met a developer from Brazil. Um, I'd only really met him once, but he seemed like a good guy and he seemed to know his stuff. And so Lush asked us, okay, do you know anyone in Brazil to help the launch? So we 
phoned this guy up, and he's been working there for the last six months, and That's he's awesome. just finished launch. So he was using, you know, he's basically been following along behind us, taking the features as we build them, and doing a lot of uh, Portuguese translation, obviously. Um, so yeah, really nice uh, little in inner story there. About yeah. the worth going to Drupal camps and Drupal code sprints. You never <laughs> know what might happen. Okay, okay. Hi. Maybe last one and then we'll call time. Yeah. Is it a Drupal distribution? And if it is Drupal distribution, is it free? Okay, so it's not a distribution specifically. Uh, it's there's a few bits of custom work that we've done. Well, quite a lot, I guess. Um, but most of it is off the shelf contrib modules. So there's not a distribution that holds it all together, but all the component parts are out there and all the component parts are free. And we've been able to build, where we've done a couple of new modules, those have gone out into, into the community. And we've got about three or four other modules that are probably candidates for going out like the one I just mentioned. So although there's some custom work in here, um, uh, most of it, the majority of it is out there for anyone. Um, sorry, guys, I think our time is up now. So thank you very much. And I'm around for the whole week anyway. We've got a, a booth if you want to come and chat any more about any of this. Um, and Commerce guys are obviously here as well. So. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, people.